بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر الخالق الكارم المصور الغفار القهار الوهاب الرزاق الفتاح العليم القابض الباسط الخافض الرافع المعز المذل السميع البصير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تآخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة The punishment will be doubled for those people The, pa- the passage began, these are special people to me And now Allah says these kabair, these three things Shirk, murder and zina Adultery, illegitimate relations These three things, if a Muslim does it Anybody else does it, they will get punished. A Muslim does it, I'll punish him double. He knew it and he still did it. The mushrik, at least he didn't know and he did it. The Muslim knew it and he still did it. On judgment day, on resurrection day, the punishment is doubled for him. muhanan, And he will remain in that punishment humiliated. He will constantly be humiliated. Because shirk and killing a person and zina are humiliating crimes. They take away the dignity of a human being. And so Allah Azza wa is extremely angry at these people. Then you're like, maybe somebody sitting in this audience that's made some mistakes in their life. Don't raise your hand. Only Allah knows your mistakes. I don't want to know. And you shouldn't tell people. It's between you and Allah. Maybe you've made some big mistakes in your life. What about you? You hear these ayahs are like, oh my God, double punishment. Maybe I should leave the masjid right now because that's pretty depressing. And then shaitan comes to those kinds of people. You know what shaitan says to them? Man, you going to hell anyway. Might as well party it up. You know, what are you doing in the masjid anymore? You're, you're already on the express train. Just go all the way, man. You know, you're already a goner. What does Allah say about these people? إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صالحة. The exception is people who did shirk, people who did murder, people who did zina. But the exception is even if you did these things, these three things or all of these things, if you turn back to Allah and you became a believer again, it's like you came, became a new Muslim and you came into Islam all over again. And this time, وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And he was very serious about doing good things from now on. It's not just عَمِلَ صَالِحًا يَقُولْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا نُسَمِّي هَذَا الْمَفْعُولَ الْمُطْلَقِ this is called the absolute additive. It's added to the verb to emphasize it over anything else. What that means in simple English is, this person came back, to, returned back to Allah, fixed their faith, and then after fixing their faith, this time they take their actions very seriously. They take their actions very, very seriously. They are really keen on doing good deeds. If you can become that person, even if you've done some terrible things in your life, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Then those people, Allah will take all of their sins and convert them into good deeds. He will not just get rid of your sins. We want Allah to get rid of our sins. Maybe your sins are the size of a mountain. I don't want to see that mountain on judgment day. Allah will not get rid of the mountain. Allah will turn the mountain into a mountain of good deeds if you can make tawbah. This is Ar-Rahman.
So uh, along that vein, there's also this this statement that that I heard um, during one of the presidential debates, and um, and I think I've heard in some other settings in kind of popular culture that that not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. Now, again, like we have Google, so we know this is not real. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> terrorists come. Uh, unfortunately for our world in all shapes, sizes, religion, um, gender, or, or across the board. Um, terrorism is not, um, no, no one tradition has a monopoly on that. Um, so I think we can clearly dispel that, that myth. Again, we have Google. It's yeah, pretty clear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we have a newspaper. And, and fortunately, we have other politicians who, who are combating that notion, including um, the mayor here in Dallas who, who has pushed up against that. Right. So, so I'm curious, like... How, where do you think this notion comes from? Why yeah. do you think that that is getting like a foothold in popular culture? Sure, sure. In 2015, there were over 300 mass shootings in America. Yeah. Only two of them were committed by Muslims. Yeah. Uh, but the, the amount of media time that those two shootings got was more than 298 other shootings, mm. right? Um, and we are quick to assume, if we can find a Muslim name when an attack happens, if there's a Muhammad in there, if he looked a little brown, if she, she looked like she might have been, right away it's a terrorist attack before the facts are put out there. Um, right, you know, and even San Bernardino, the terrible tragedy of San Bernardino, a lot was lost in that, by the way. Number one, there was a Muslim lady that's a, a board member of a mosque over there in California that was shot three times. Mm. She didn't die, thankfully, but she was shot three times. So this clearly wasn't about Muslims going and killing a bunch of non-Muslims. Um, number two, the, the whole thing about, you know, for ex right away you had candidates jumping on it, you had people jumping on it, this was ISIS, ISIS has come to America, so on and so forth. Uh, turns out that the whole thing about the, the, the young lady giving a uh, pledge of allegiance to ISIS turned out to be a complete sham. It actually never happened. Mm. So, we, don't, we, we completely throw out all the nuances there. Mental health is thrown out, workplace is thrown out, unstable families are thrown out. Everything that gets afforded to every other killer is thrown out. If you can somehow associate that person with Islam, Islam is to blame. So it's not true historically. I mean, we just exited the most violent century in world history. Yeah. There were almost a quarter billion people killed in the 1900s. Yeah. Uh, they weren't killed in the name of Islam. They weren't killed in the name of Christianity, actually. I mean, there's this, this thought that uh, religion is responsible for violence, right? right. Uh, they were killed in the name of fascism. They were killed in the name of communism. They were killed in the name of democracy. Uh, here in the United States, there was this thought before World War II, though you and I weren't around, right? But there was this thought that uh, Russia and Germany r represented two evil ideologies. Let them kill each other off. One of them will kill the other one off, right? Mm -hmm. Because you had all these ideologies, lo and behold, they weren't Islam, they weren't Muslims. Historically, if you just search the bloodiest conflicts in history and the death tolls, the ones that were killed in the name of Islam are very, 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 very small. Now here's the response to that that people give. They say, yeah, well, you know, fine, Christianity worked out its mess in, in the Middle Ages. It's Islam's turn. But even today, that's not true. Statistically speaking, that's not true. Um, when it comes to suicide terrorism, there was a book written by Robert Pape called Dying to Win, where he traced every suicide bombing. The, the origin of suicide terrorism, Japanese kamikazes, they're not Muslims, or at least mm -hmm. I don't think they are. The Tamil Tigers, a secularist group, not Muslims at all. Um, and basically he shows how every single suicide bombing in history, even in modern history, traces the last 100 years, was carried out for a clear political goal. It, had not, it was not carried out for a religious goal, it was carried out for a clear political goal. When we look at... Um, so, I mean, often, yeah. is, there, is there a religious incentive in Islam for that kind of martyrdom? To is, go out and just kill people? And, and, yeah, to, well, <laughs> to kill people, sacrifice yourself in the process to, to advance the faith. So, there are a few things here. Number one, it says in the Quran that whoever kills a soul without right, an innocent person without right, is as if he has killed all of mankind. Mm. And whoever saves a life, is it, as, is, it is as if he has saved all of mankind. Mm. Um, again, you're not allowed to kill women, not allowed to kill civilians, not allowed to kill children, so on and so forth. To summarize, you know, there's the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did say that, uh, which means don't ever wish to meet someone in battle. Don't wish to meet anyone in, in battle. Okay? So you should not look for 
war. You should not look for uh, violence and so on and so forth. Uh, however, once a battle takes place, once there is, so, so the Quran does talk about defending the innocent um, and defending the oppressed and, and fighting for just cause. Just war is not uniquely an Islamic concept. This right. is a concept that exists in every system. Uh, yes, there, there is a lot of, there's, there's glory for those who die in just war and die in just, I mean, here in the United States, right, when it comes to the U.S. military and so on and so forth, there's glory in defending a just cause. So yes, that is certainly there, the reward for martyrs and so on and so forth, that's, that's there, that's talked about. Um, but that doesn't mean going out and killing innocent people. And if we're going to call out every, everything that happens by a Muslim, um, you know, uh, Peter Bergen, who's a national security correspondent, he recently wrote a book called United States of Jihad. Okay. And, he, and he said that since 9-11, um, the amount of people killed, I believe those killed in the name of Islamic terrorism, we're talking about 15 years now, we're about 43. Those killed in the name of white supremacy, <laughs> we're almost double that number, right? Why is that not terrorism? Okay, I, why is Dylan Roof not terrorism? That's, I mean, the guy was posing with flags, he clearly had an agenda, a political agenda, when he went there and shot those people as they were worshiping. Why is that not called terrorism? I grew up in Louisiana, I'm from Louisiana, and I, so I grew up seeing the Ku Klux Klan, their rallies. Uh, they, they popped up here in Irving recently, right? We didn't even know that they were still around, but they popped right. up here in Irving. Um, I mean, hey, that, that's, that's in the name of Christianity. Is Christianity to blame for that? So statistically speaking, uh, less than 2% of Muslims are radicalized. Less than 2%. Now someone says 10% of Muslims you know, are radicalized. That's a terrible thing around the world. You're focusing on a very small section of the community because it fits your ideological agenda. So, but but part of the recruitment effort on 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 the part of ISIS, right, mm -hmm. is, is appealing to some of the very things that you talked about, right? Is appealing to um, a lack of justice. Is appealing to you know some of these places where the world has treated people unfairly, right. and the the part of the recruitment for ISIS is to stand up for the oppressed. Sure. Um, and so in, in the midst of, you know, this and if you were to encounter someone who, who is watching ISIS recruitment videos or, or who has been recruited by ISIS or is considering, you know, being a part of a radicalized group, you know, and they say back to you, but, but look, look at the oppressive systems that are in place and don't we have a responsibility to fight against that? What, sure. What, what's your response to that person? First and foremost, just sort of on the previous point, um, you know, we have to treat these cases with all of its political nuance. We have to look at them with a comprehensive lens and not just associate religion with it. So people are not, people are not in healthy context. It's not like people are sitting in Malaysia or in, 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 in Turkey or so on and so forth. Or those are probably bad, Turkey's probably a bad example now because Syria's next door, right? But it's not people that are coming from healthy backgrounds in healthy countries that are suddenly reading the Quran and getting radicalized, right? There are Buddhist monks that are killing the Burmese off and the Central African Republic, Christians that have wiped out the Muslim population or people that claim to be Christian, people that claim to be Buddhist. Uh, in Kenya, uh, there was the news story that came recently where uh, a terrorist group, again, claiming to act in the name of Islam, tried to attack a bus full of Christians and Muslims and they told the Muslims, get off the bus so we can attack the Christians. And the Muslims stayed on the bus hmm. and protected the Christians against this oh. crazy group. Right? So first you have to treat it as a political group. It's not religion that's making them do these things, that's appealing to them. So then what does that leave us now to with, with these extremist groups and so on and so forth? Well, Iraq has been bombed by four consecutive presidents. <laughs> it's, it's a very unstable uh, political situation. Uh, Syria was left out to dry. Bashar al-Assad killed over 200,000 of his own people and we did nothing about it. So when those countries go to hell in the political sense, in the economic sense, that, that becomes a breeding ground because you have frustrated people that have seen their parents killed, they've seen, they've seen all types of things happen. And interestingly enough, what, more and more when you see what's going on with ISIS, it's a group of mercenaries, right? They're, they're literally taking young people, giving them money. Most of them are not even being recruited for ideological reasons. It's, it's, it's here's your future. There's money, to, there's cash here to offer, yeah. right? How do we deal with this situation? 
Number one, as a country and as a group of people that are trying to fight this, we have to recognize that, um, that, that we have to be very, very critical of our foreign policy. We have to look at what our foreign policy goals are, what our involvement in the Middle East is, where it's positive, where it's negative. We have to have those, those very uncomfortable discussions. Number two, the young people that are joining ISIS, unstable homes, depressed, you know, look at the Boston bombers, right? Isolated from their families, having trouble at work and so on and so forth. They're not going to these places for glory, for, for glorious reasons. They, they hate life as it is. Right. This is a place to go die a, a glorious death and to get your revenge and so on and so forth. And yeah, if I'm depressed in life and I want to end my life anyway, and then I have this guy over here promising me a glorious death and, and great things in the afterlife, yeah, of course, it's a very appealing, it's a very appealing message, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Even if I don't have a political goal in that, it's a very appealing message to go and, and get all these great things in life. Um, but then the political side of it, um, what I tell young people you know, that, are, that are thinking about this, I tell them, you know, what good are you serving? How are you making the cause of the oppressed better? How are you not making things absolutely worse? you know, by, by going and, and committing these heinous acts and doing these things. It's a very small group of people, no doubt. Yeah. But what are you doing to further these causes? And so we have to meet halfway. There are people that have very legitimate political frustrations. And we could be guilty of a 21st century McCarthyism where, you know, uh, just like in the 1950s, the way to silence dissent, the way, the government, the way people would silence dissent was if anyone questioned the United States foreign policy, they were communist sympathizers. So now, are we offering a legitimate voice for people to voice their frustrations about U.S. foreign policy without feeling like they're going to be targeted and bunched up into, you know, in, into this group and their phones are going to be tapped and they're going to be pursued and so on and so forth? Are they having that outlet? Are, so are they, are they able to voice their frustrations? What we have to do is we have to channel the frustrations that people have with, with our foreign policy in a positive direction and how you can make meaningful change, and how this going overseas and joining ISIS actually makes things worse for your community, makes things worse for everybody. It's just your own selfish way to escape life because you found, you found a dead end everywhere you went in life. So we have to, it's, it's a multi-faceted discussion. Um, well, and there's something heartbreaking about that for me, right? To, to sit and, you know, because like one of the questions I asked earlier, in part because it's the kind of thing that we hear from time to time is, you know, whether or not someone can be Muslim and also be a patriot, right? And, and my understanding of patriotism that I've understood since I was in elementary school is, is a willingness to speak out against the government when you believe that the government is doing, doing wrong, is doing ill. Sure. Um, that that is a patriotic move. Uh, and so it's sad for me to know that Muslim citizens of the United States feel silenced feel like they can't, you know, speak their mind, that they can't voice that patriotic responsibility, which is to hold the government accountable well, um, well, without being do. labeled, you know, and, and so it's, it's sad for me to hear. Well, well many of them do, and, and, and part of it is that Muslims don't feel like they're represented properly in the political arena. I think a lot of the sure. population feels like they're caught between two extremes, right? Yeah. Um, you don't completely associate with the Democrats, you don't completely associate with the Republicans, but there's no centrist party in the United States. Right. So you just have to always choose the lesser of the two evils, right? That doesn't resonate with everybody, right? right. So, so, so patriotism is indeed, you know, that you love your country enough to try to steer it in a direction that you feel like is most beneficial for it. Um, but do people feel ostracized for voicing their opinions? Do, do young Muslims feel like they have a voice, a legitimate voice? Or do they just feel like the only voices of Muslims that are being heard are the pandering voices, yeah. right? the voices that will say exactly what, what the government wants to hear. So we have to create that space. Um, and, and the worst thing that we could possibly do, the absolute worst thing we could possibly do, is to confirm ISIS's message that Islam and America are inherently incompatible. That you cannot be a Muslim American, that your value system, is con you know, your value system, religious value system, contradicts your, 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 citizen, your citizen's responsibilities and so on and so forth that all of this is contradictory because they want that clash of civilizations. So when politicians get up there and they say that, you know, we're at war with Islam, they're actually confirming ISIS's message. ISIS is saying you're at war with Islam. <laughs> and, and then you're saying you're at war with Islam as a country. 
you're, you're feeding into that message and it is a fact. Um, and this has been gone through many times in, in, you know, in, in discussions of security that the, that the material that's being pushed out there in media outlets by politicians is used as propaganda recruiting material for, for people. You know, it's, it's, it's sad that uh, people, <laughs> I, I've been overseas a few times recently. I, I promise it wasn't to Syria. I didn't join any group, right? <laughs> but I've, I've been overseas. I've been to the Muslim world. And you know that people in the Muslim world genuinely think that all Muslims are about to be thrown out of the country. I mean, they actually say, you know, what are you guys going to do if you get banned? How are you going to, I'm an American. I've never, I don't have another passport. This is my only, what are you going to do if you get banned? Where are you going to go? You know, what are you going to do if, if Donald Trump becomes president? Are you going to run away? Are you, I mean, are you going to leave before they kick you out? So that type of rhetoric is absolutely destructive. And we have to be very, very careful not to feed ISIS's machine by saying, indeed, Islam and, and America are inherently at war and that you are a paradox. You can't be a good American and a good Muslim at the same time. We have to actually make people comfortable with the idea of being great Muslim Americans um, that can contribute, as we have been doing. I mean, millions of Muslims here are very successful, very well integrated. We're one of the most integrated communities in this country. Uh, and economically and, and politically and so on and so forth. So it can happen, but we can't feed that message. Just, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious, as someone who's a leader of a community that sits in that awkward and difficult in-between space, um, when there are times like this past fall, when armed protesters um, showed up at the Islamic Center in Irving, um, right outside of the place of worship and at a time that people were coming in for worship. Um, you know, there are all these messages that, that, that give a sense of like, you don't belong here. And, and I'm curious, like what, what spiritual resources do you offer your people as they're going through times like that? Um, where, do they, where do they find hope? Where do they, you know, how, how do they navigate through the difficulties that come with being a part of a society, but not really? We're feeling like you're a part of society at work, and then you show up for worship on Saturday and find out you're not. Right. So how do you navigate that as a spiritual leader? The first thing we teach our community uh, is forgiveness, the quality of forgiveness. Mm. Um, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was uh, struck in uh, the Battle of Uhud, which was the second battle, major battle in Islam, he was struck into a ditch and he was hit in the head and his teeth were knocked out. And he said, uh, Oh Allah, forgive my people for they don't know any better. And so we teach people that same message, like they just don't know any better. If you know, they don't know you, they don't know any better. They've been, you know, literally have had hatred funneled into their minds and hearts for however many years. Um, give them a positive interaction. Make them think twice. You know, show them, show them your good side. Don't let them teach you bad character. You teach them good character. Don't let them teach you to hate. You teach them to love. And so we have to respond with that with that grace that we're taught to respond as. And this, that's, that's what we all feed off of in our faith yeah. traditions, right? Grace, respond to evil with grace. Um, and so if I'm at a restaurant, and look, <laughs> Islamophobia now, uh, the way that Muslims are treated now, especially Muslim women, literally, many of them literally wearing their faith on their heads, right? Yeah. The way that they're treated, it's a daily thing now. You know, you're 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 flipped off on the highway. You're run off the road. You're you're yelled at at Walmart. Your your waitress treats you like garbage. Your professor is discriminating against you. Um, you know, the dirty looks. It's become part of our daily life here, right? And what we have to do is not let that make us negative, but instead we have to respond. We have to we have to rise to the challenge. And the challenge is, can your heart expand enough? to where you can respond to all that negativity with something positive and with mercy and with love. And you can actually make that waitress think twice next time another Muslim comes into the restaurant. Uh, because you responded with a smile and you made them think twice about what they did or what they said or how they looked at you. The greatest challenge is that our kids, um, yeah. a lot of Muslim kids are asked, you know, have asked their parents, are we going to get kicked out? Are we, are we going to live? Because you can imagine what damage it does to the psyche of a child that's going to the mosque and seeing people holding big guns outside and chanting go back home and yelling terrible things at them. So it's, it's an uphill battle, um, but we'll get through it. And it's not the first time it's happened in America, right? It's, it's our turn, <laughs> but we're, we'll be okay. We'll, we'll make it through it and, and I think we'll be just fine. And I, I hope that this will be a learning experience. It'll be an opportunity for us 
And we know election years get really, really, really bad because we are the whipping boy of every politician out there that wants to gain some sort of approval um, and ignore, you know, ignore true political uh, issues and, and, and just focus on this Muslim community because we're just a political liability. So we have to, as a community, become more engaged. Um, we have to counter those negative interactions with positive interactions. And I think we'll become a more, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in a better place after this is all done. And hopefully it won't take long. And hopefully we'll be in a place where we can help uh, other people that are being discriminated against as well. Well, and for what it's worth, um, you know, as just a, a drop in the ocean, though, you know, I have this uh, church that operates a coffee shop, right? We operate in the coffee shop. We are the coffee shop. It's messy, but it's great. Um, and. Awesome. Um, you know, one of the things that I count as a personal victory every day is the day doesn't go by that there isn't someone there with a hijab. Um, mm. that there isn't someone who I know is Muslim and they feel comfortable there and they feel welcome there. Um, sure. and, uh, and that holds incredible value for me. Uh, and I know that there are others for whom that's the case. Yeah. And, and I hope that there are more and more ways um, for those stories of hope, um, for business leaders, for religious leaders, for others to know that, that that's a value and that's that's who we can be here in Dallas um, and that's who we can be in the United States. Um, Absolutely. Um, I'm grateful for uh, the tenacity uh, that you offer, the surprising amount of patience that you offer um, in the face of uh, what feels to me like injustice in my place of privilege, um, that when I look and see um, it feels unjust. It doesn't feel American, um, and uh, um, so I appreciate your surprising amount of patience in the midst of it. Um, We're grateful for people like you that can <laughs> see through all the nonsense, right? And that can that can actually that actually have open hearts and that actually have open minds and that are actually able to talk to us and interact with us and see through all the the propaganda and the hatred that's out there. Yeah. So we're we're far more grateful for people like. You all, you know, um, and having you in our midst, and that's that's part. That's what gives us hope. I mean, really, it does because uh, it shows us that there's a different side to America than what's being portrayed out there, right? And we know that um, that it's not all, not everyone is out there calling for <laughs> calling for a war right. on Islam and for us to be uh, banned and deported. But there are there is a significant group of people. There is a significant amount of people in this country that that still want to see America become that tolerant pluralistic, uh, you know, place that, that accommodates people of all faiths and all, yeah. all colors and creeds. Well, there is power in conversation. <laughs> yeah. uh, the ability to actually sit down and, and hear from someone and, and those conversations, if we're really going to get into the issues and really understand, you know, we said earlier how religion is difficult to understand and figure out. Um, it's not conversations that take place in five minutes, though that's a good start. Um, if we're going to truly do our, our duty, um, I believe as people of God, I believe as uh, Americans, whatever the case might be, if we're going to do our duty to figure out how to live together well in society, to walk with one another in integrity, to stand by our principles, it takes time invested in conversation. Um, and so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be in conversation with you today. Um, my hope is, is that this is the first of many. Um, my hope is that um, we might inspire some folks who are watching to engage in conversation, uh, to talk at someone, whether it's in the parking lot at Walmart um, or whether it is by inviting someone over for dinner or accepting that invitation to try, you know, the cookies that some uh, wonderful <laughs> woman has, uh, or, uh, has baked. If you um, bite twice and nothing happens, then most likely you're good. Yeah, you're, you're good. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's that's my hope out of this is that uh, so much of what we hear about Islam in America comes primarily from politicians, it comes from pundits, it comes from people who are offering 10 word answers. Um, and I believe that we're called to something more. So I hope that this is the beginning of a lot of conversations, not only for the two of us um, and for folks who are here with us, uh, but for all those who are watching and for us as a nation as a whole. Um, that as individuals, as corporations, and as media companies, uh, and as political parties, um, we can engage in more fruitful conversation and dialogue uh, to bring about a better world. So thank you. I really want to thank appreciate you. your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. When he spoke to his companions, 
he would never be seated while his companions stood around him. And he was never seen stretching his legs while sitting with his companions. When a messenger of a king came to the city of Medina with a letter to the prophet, he did not find a palace to go to and deliver the message. When he asked about the whereabouts of the prophet, he was told that he was in a meeting with his companions, so he went to see them. When he reached, he couldn't tell which of them was the prophet, because he sat in the midst of his companions, just like the rest of them. He wore like them, he ate like them, he lived in a house like their houses. He was one of them. That was Prophet Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum everybody, a quick message from the team at Voice of Islam. Every time our show airs, we reach a potential audience in the hundreds of thousands. We bring the truth about Islam to non-Muslims and help Muslims learn more about their own faith. Every time something positive comes from Voice of Islam being on air, those people who have contributed and made the broadcast possible share in the potential rewards, inshallah. We really appreciate people donating what they can. Every little bit helps us meet the cost of broadcasting each week. We sincerely thank everyone who has helped us and continues to do so, and we look forward to more help in the future, inshallah. If you are keen to contribute, please visit our website for details of how to do so. Welcome back. Suicide is a leading cause of death among young people, and it is mostly driven by undiagnosed depression. What are the signs of depression? What can we do to help if a friend or family member appears to be struggling with depression or suicidal tendencies? We discuss this with Sheikh Yasser Fazaga during his visit to Toronto for the Reviving the Islamic Spirit Convention. Sheikh Yasser is Imam of Orange County Islamic Foundation and Director of Mental Health Department in Anaheim, California. Let's see what he has to say about recognizing the signs of depression. Sheikh Yasser, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, so in a previous show, we talked about uh, the broad issue of mental health. Um, and one of the topics that you brought up was the issue of suicide and how it is a leading cause of uh, death amongst the ages of 18 to 25. So I was wondering if we could break that, break that down a little bit. What are the causes that actually, uh, you know, within young people that, that, that lead them to commit suicide? So in the States, uh, statistically speaking, there is one person that takes away their own life every 15 minutes. Around the world, uh, suicide is the 11th cause, uh, leading cause of death amongst, amongst people. And what we have said is that 80% of the people who commit a suicide, it's actually, it was due to um, undiagnosed depression. And what we want to do is that uh, tell people about what depression is, because this is really, in 80% of the cases, that is, this is what is leading people to, to commit suicide. And by depression, depression is a mood disorder that mainly has got nine different symptoms about it. And as, as, as much as you can, please, and to the audience as well, try not to psychoanalyze your own family members okay. at this point. <laughs> the tendency is that, you know, I'm hearing these symptoms and, you know, I see them in my, you know, so please try I don't not. have a pen, so I can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> not, not do that. But usually what we are looking at is uh, a sense of social isolation that is not explained. By that I mean maybe it's the finals week. So I understand why people are socially isolated. People are studying. Maybe a person has a project. Maybe they just started a new job. So we're looking for social isolation that is not explained. Uh, people not enjoying what they used to enjoy in the past. They, we always saw them. They always called us. They returned our call. But now they're socially isolated. They no longer take joy in what it is that they were taking joy in previously. We're looking into a change in their sleeping habits. They're sleeping too much. They're sleeping too little. We're looking at a change in their uh, diet. They're eating too much. They're eating too little. They're losing weight. They're gaining weight. We're looking into their level of energy. They just seem to be tired all of the time. Their physical language, their body language, that they just droop most of the time. Their shoulders are down, head down. They just look tired most of the time. We're talking about people who speak about death uh, a good number of the time. People who cry for no good reason. We're looking into people who have got very little tolerance for irritants. 
they're easily provoked, inability to concentrate, having poor um, memory, and overall just uh, an overwhelming sense of, of sadness. And that is really not them. So if a person has had these uh, six of these symptoms for a period of more than two weeks without really any life-changing event taking place, then we would say most likely that person is clinically depressed. And it's very important to understand that these symptoms are not related to a life-changing event, meaning people failing a class. You know what, I really don't want to talk to people when I failed my class. I don't, I don't feel like enjoying anything. I'll be crying, I'll be irritated. So that is understandable. People lost a job. People you know, lost a loved one. People who have gone through divorce. So what happens is that we would say that would be a normal reaction. And at that point, as friends, as family members, we want to give as much support as we can to these people. What we're looking at is if there is no event that explains why this person would be behaving the way that they do, then that is when we really want to reach out and inquire as to why is this happening to them. And I think it's also very important to understand that at this point, the role of friends and family members is very, very critical. What we found out, and um, because at Access we actually have a grant to um, give support to survivors of suicide. This is in the U.S., right? This is this is in the U.S. So part of what I do is that we know we hold support groups, or at least at this point we're still struggling to get a support group of of Muslims to speak about you know what suicide. So I know them as individuals. You know what my dad committed suicide. Our son committed suicide. What we're finding out is that a good number of people prior to them committing suicide, they actually reach out to people. They make a phone call. They post something on Facebook. They text a friend. This is including the Muslim community as this well? This is including the Muslim community as well. You know, prior to doing it, it's almost like, you know what, it's the last chance, like begging for help. I just want to see if somebody can talk me out of it. So they reach out to their friends. And there was actually an interesting um, um, story when one person, he was on their way to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge in uh, San Francisco. And what they said is that they said, um, you know, they're walking down the bridge and they said, if somebody just asks me how I am doing, I will not do it. So he walks by and there was a couple and they had their cameras and they were taking pictures. So they said, they spoke to him. And here's what he said. He said, all they said was, can you please take a picture? But they really did not ask as to how I was doing. So he took the picture and he continued and he jumped and obviously he didn't die and that's why we know the story that, uh, that we do. So he jumped, how long does it take from the Golden Gate Bridge to hit the water? Take a guess. Two seconds? Four seconds. Oh, okay, I was close. Four <laughs> seconds, that's actually very close. So he, you know, he decided that he didn't want to um, die and he, he, he just uh, the way that he jumped, he survived. But I think the key word here is that he said, I wanted somebody to ask, how am I doing? So when we realize these symptoms about our friends, about our family members, I think that what really happens is that we want somebody to just ask us, how am I doing? You know, have you ever had friends who just say, they, they sigh in front of yeah. you, it's like, it's an invitation. Yes. Yes. Oh, what's wrong, what is going on? <laughs> yes. so, so many times we give, we make these bits, it's like inviting other people to ask us because we just don't want to come and volunteer the information. And I think that's really, really when we say that, you know what, we have been good friends to our friends. So it's just about opening that conversation and being cognizant of people that you're around. And I would even say, be, be very open, ask the person directly. I say, look, I, I hear this, are you considering suicide? Don't, don't be afraid of using the word suicide. Um, people think that I don't want to give them ideas. If a friend tells you that they've been thinking about killing themselves, here's what you do. Number one, continue to talk to them. That's very important. Number two, let them know that they can trust you. Uh, number three, ask, do they have a plan? Is this a thought or is this a plan? If it's a plan that is really serious, I really need to talk to somebody who is you know, there with you at this, um, at this point. That person needs to be monitored. They might even be, you know, uh, they might need to go to the, um, to the hospital. But when a friend, a family member, a co-worker 
lets you know that they're really considering killing themselves, they're entertaining suicide, please take that very, very serious. Thank you. This was very informative. Thank you very much, Sheikh Yasser. Thank you for having me. The apple of Macintosh dazzled the world. It was invented by Steve Jobs. But who invented the apple we eat? The stethoscope. It was invented by the French physician René Lenec in 1818. But who created the ear in which we hear everything? The calculator was invented by the Frenchman Blase Pascal in 1639. Who created the human brain which equals one million of advanced calculators working at the same time? The electric light bulb which we turn to lighten a room. It was invented by Thomas Edison in 1879. So who created the self-illuminating sun which radiates the whole world? The plane. It was invented by Wilbur Wright in 1903. But who invented the systems and birds that enable them to fly long distances? He is Allah, the creator of everything. Look for him. You will find him. So in our last episode, we finished the discussion about the journey of the souls, the good soul and the bad soul. Now we come to the last place of rest, the grave. And one of the great companions, Uthman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, his friends noticed something very weird about him. That when he saw a burial taking place, he would start to cry and shed tears. And any other time when death was talked about or heaven or hell were talked about, he wasn't very moved. And so his friends asked him, why are you so moved when you see a burial taking place, when you go to a graveyard? And he said, may Allah be pleased with him, the grave is the first step. It's the first stage of the next life. And if the grave goes good, if whatever happens in the grave is done well, then the rest of the journey of the hereafter is easy and smooth. And if the grave goes bad, if something wrong happens in there, then the rest of the journey will be very difficult. What is he referring to? May Allah be pleased with him. He's referring to the questioning of the grave. Every single one of us will have their mom and dad, their sister or their brother, their friends. Every single one of us will have loved ones around us that will have to experience the process of burying us. Taking us with their own hands and laying us in the very dirt that we walk over. And so, as soon as they cover us with the dirt, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he tells us what happens. And when we're all laid in that grave, good soul and bad soul, It'll be dark, we'll be alone, it'll be cold, we'll be by ourselves. And then out of nowhere, two figures will appear. They will stand us up. They are two specialized angels that are responsible for asking the questions that Allah the Almighty wants answered in the grave. And so they will ask for the good soul. Who is your master? Who is your Lord? They are asking, who was it that you lived your life in submission to? Was it your creator? Was it your master? Was it your Lord? Was it God Almighty? Or was it something else? The good soul will answer that question as quickly as possible because it lived its whole life in submission to the creator. It was one of the souls that submitted to Allah the Most High. And so it will say Allah. Then it will be asked, and what is your deen? What is the way that you lived your life? How did you live your life? And the soul will simply say, I was a Muslim, I submitted. I was of those that was in submission to the creation. I lived in accordance to the guidance of the divine. Easy answer. And the last question, who was the man that was sent to you? Who was the messenger? Who was the man that God chose to deliver his message to you? And he will say, or she will say, 
the Prophet of its time. The Prophet that came and conveyed the message of Allah to them and they accepted that message wholeheartedly. Muhammad, the final messenger. The good soul will have an easy way of answering. Its questions will come out very quickly. It's prepared. It's done its homework. It's prepared for the exam. As for the evil soul, the angels will wake it up in its grave and it will be so startled and so frightened. It will be full of fear and it will be asked the same questions. Who is your Lord? Who is your master? Who did you submit to? And the answers vary because many people, they live their lives submitting to their friends, submitting to oppressors, submitting to criminals, submitting to those that are evil in life. And all they were were pawns in the game. And so it would say that thing, that false thing, that evil thing, that deity that it shouldn't have taken as a deity. So the second question it will be asked is, how did you live your life? And it will say something other than submitting itself, the best thing of saying, submitting myself to the Creator. And who was the man sent to you? And some souls will say, I don't know. It will say some name of some man that it falsely took in his, in his guidance or her guidance and any other answer other than Allah, Islam and Muhammad will not be accepted. It won't be a good answer. And so these are the questions of the grave that every human has to answer before they move on to the next phase. We will continue the journey in our next episode by discussing a little bit more what happens then in the grave. So the important lesson today is to understand that everyone will be asked these three essential questions. And the only way that you can answer them, it's not by memorizing, it's not like you could sit there in front of a paper or in front of a book and just keep drilling them into your brain cells. You won't have any more brain cells. You will have to answer those questions with your faith. How strong was your faith? How much was your commitment to your Lord and your Master? Everything that's important in life comes down to that faith. Who was your master? Allah? Did you submit to something other than Allah? Did you worship and obey something other than Allah? Were you living your life for something other than the creator of the universe? The reason why you exist. Number two, what is your way of submitting? The best thing that he sent us is Islam. All of the aspects of Islam. Living our life completely in submission from everything that we do in life, we can be rewarded for and our Master and our Lord rewards us for if we commit in doing it for Him. And the last question, who is this man that was sent to guide humanity? Who is Muhammad the son of Abdullah? What were his attributes? Why was he so great? Who was he as an individual? So many of us know so little about who Allah really is. And what is this Islam thing? And who is the man named Muhammad? And the lesson for today is that we make sure to learn as much as possible about Allah and His dynamics, His attributes. Who is He? What does Islam teach us and how does it bring us happiness and bliss in life? And who is Muhammad? What were his attributes? How was he an important role model that I should emulate every day of my existence? These are the essential questions and the essential knowledge that we will need to carry with us into the next life. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim Today I will be discussing laziness and how to overcome it. The Arabic term for laziness is ghusl and it's considered to be a disease. It begins as a mindset, first of all, followed by an effect on the heart and then finally the body becomes less willing. It is a tool of shaitan. He whispers things like, you don't need to pray Fajr, you need your sleep, or with regards sin, everyone else is doing it. The modern idea of perfectionism is also used by shaitan and actually contributes to laziness. You see, if we place pressure on ourselves to be absolutely perfect all of the time, then we begin to create mountains out of the simple requirements of deen. We start saying things like, it's too hard for me, I'll leave it. But perfectionism is not required. All that is required is that we try our best 
with the best of intentions. Laziness is not to be taken lightly and we have been taught several du'as to overcome it. For instance, the Prophet used to say, O Allah, I seek refuge from incapability and laziness. Brothers and sisters, we really should have no room for laziness in our lives. Why? Because this life is a test. How many times have we heard this without really understanding what it means? It means, whatever we do in this life determines whether we will end up in heaven or hell for eternity. The thing about this life is that it is short and there are no guarantees as to how long our life will be. This life contains pleasures and pains to some extent. However, the thing about the hereafter is that it contains pleasures we cannot imagine, but by the same token, it contains horrors we cannot imagine too. This life on earth is our only opportunity to live it well, so that in the hereafter we will not suffer unimaginable horrors, but live in bliss for eternity. I would like to go through a few ways to help us overcome laziness. 1. Seek help in dhikr. Doing dhikr helps us overcome laziness and it should boost our energy levels. Fatima an, was taught by her father a means to boost her energy in the following way. The Prophet وسلم, told her, Shall I not teach you something better than what you ask for? When you go to your bed, magnify Allah 34 times, glorify him 33 times and praise him 33 times. That is better for you than a servant. Allahu Akbar allows us to reflect on Allah's majesty and how he provides a solution to all our problems. Subhanallah brings to mind the universe and creation in all of its glory. Alhamdulillah allows us to think of Allah's numerous blessings upon us from our five senses to the food and shelter we enjoy. 2. Seek help through Salah Laziness is mentioned twice in the Quran and on both occasions linked with Salah. We are required to pray five times a day, a daily obligation, a pillar of Islam and arguably one of the most difficult things to maintain, particularly the Fajr prayer. But if we can maintain our daily prayers, then other requirements of the deen become easier. If, however, we struggle with salah, how can we begin to cope with other requirements of the deen such as zakah, hajj or fasting? Also, salah being a physical process keeps our bodies active and supple. 3. Aim high The Prophet ﷺ and the Sahabas an are shining examples for us to aim at being like. True, we may never attain anything close to them, but we can still learn from them and try our best to be as good as we can be. The Sahaba approached the Qur'an for guidance with a complete willingness to submit. They treated the Qur'an like we do our mobile phones today. They kept it close and followed it to the letter. 4. Set religious goals in life. Be proactive. Set yourselves goals within the deen and try to achieve them. This keeps your spiritual growth alive. The internet is a fantastic resource. There is access to many scholars with suggestions of how to live our lives and maintain our deen. 5. Good company. Seek out the company of good people, grateful people, hard-working people. This will impact on your own attitude. Take the initiative to join forums and groups online. 6. Find something practical to do. Exercise, gardening, baking, volunteering. These activities are all good for us and keep us physically active. At the same time, they produce endorphins which provide us with the urge and motivation to do more. Remember, make it a point to ask of Allah daily to put blessings into your time. Once you ask Allah, Allah will be sure to help you. Welcome back. Now we answer questions we've received from you, our viewers. If you have a question yourself, visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. Okay, Brother Shabir, here's a question. I'm a fairly new Muslim and I don't know Arabic. Is it acceptable to pray in English? 
The simple answer is yes, and th that is based on uh, the fact that uh, God understands all languages. And uh, while Muslims have traditionally prayed in Arabic, and it, there's a certain beauty in, in the fact that Muslims have maintained the same uh, expressions which are reported uh, as, as having been the expressions used by the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his prayer. And of course, the Quran has re re been retained in the Arabic language, that too being incorporated uh, in, in the prayers. Uh, that um, and does not make it necessary, that, that, that beauty and elegance and so on of having the unified Muslim body pray, all praying in the same language, uh, does not make it necessary. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, one of the great uh, jurists uh, of Islam, has actually held that uh, people could pray in Persian. And uh, he said that, in fact, uh, those who are originally Persian should pray in Persian, even if they know some Arabic, uh, because when they pray in their own language, they, uh, the prayer will be more meaningful to them. But, but uh, despite that, uh, it became commonplace for Muslims to teach uh, their children to pray in Arabic, even though they're not Arabic speakers and they would not sometimes know what, they, what they're saying, they just memorize the, the words. Now, how can somebody pray in English today? Well, uh, most handbooks of, of the Muslim prayer are, are written with uh, what is to be, first of all, if, if it's written for English readers, all of the explanations and instructions are given in English, but when it uh, comes to what to recite, what to recite is written three ways often. Uh, first, it's written in Arabic script. Second, the Arabic words are spelled out using English script. And then uh, third, the English translation of what is to be recited is given. So one can start by reciting the English translation. And then maybe at a second stage, one might start reciting the Arabic words uh, following the English script. And then maybe later on, one would learn the Arabic language to be able to recite the Arabic script as well. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Jabir Ali. You're welcome. That's all the time we have. Visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. And check out our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash QuranSpeaks.